I want to keep it simple today, and I want to keep it practical. Um, how many of you know that whoever the sun sets free is free indeed? Right? I mean, he died so that we could be free. Miko preached a sermon, now it's been maybe a year, but the thing just lodged in my spirit. <clears throat> and it was called that field, uh, the field called Liberty. That Jesus died, and when we put our trust in him, when we start that amazing adventure of walking daily with him, depending on him, our opportunities do not become constricted and limited, and we've got to stop doing this and stop doing that and don't hang out with people who do the other. Actually, your life opens up. That you have the freedom now to do things that you could never do in your own understanding or your own power. You're now at liberty to bring freedom into the lives of other people. How many believe that? That honestly, an encounter with Jesus breaks the power of sin, of bondage. It breaks the yoke. It breaks self-performance. It breaks introspection. A, a relationship with Jesus is intended to help you step out of that false self of who you thought you were and into the true self of knowing what love is and knowing how to demonstrate love. I mean, isn't that really the heart of the gospel? And we know we can love because we first were loved. And, and yet, I've been walking with the Lord, I don't know, maybe 40 years now. And I can't believe the areas that He has touched, the things that He has protected me from. Uh, actually, I'm going to do a, a, a dual uh, testimony today. So Robert, if you don't mind, would, would you come up just real quick? Robert, um, I love the testimony you've been sharing at men's group uh, about Lord, what's really in it for me? And uh, if you wouldn't mind sharing that, because sometimes I really wonder if we realize just what we've been saved from. So that's the one you want. That's the one I want. I was in the hospital with COVID pneumonia for a couple of days. And while I was there, I, uh, kind of got discouraged, and uh, the Lord's given me grace to question him. He's very merciful. But anyway, so I'm in the hospital feeling discouraged, and I just said, Lord, this following you business, what's in it for me? <clears throat> that was a nice, humble response. And uh, I got this picture. It was like the Lord said, well, you could be divorced, drug addicted, in debt, and homeless if you had made worse decisions. So thank you, Lord, for good decisions. <laughs> Come on. We don't know who we would be without the grace of God. We don't know where we would be without his love drawing us continually and transforming us. And, and yet, in my life, there are still areas that I struggle with. And so I know I haven't come into that field called liberty. I know I haven't been set free in certain areas. And I know that I have a growing belief, confidence, and faith that Jesus is able in my life and in the lives of others. And so I've been reflecting this week on the verse in 1 Corinthians 6.12. And it really speaks to this theme. Uh, but I really want to have a focus of the Lord setting us free to be who we are really created to be. So 1 Corinthians 6.12 says, All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated in the ESV, mastered in another version, enslaved by anything. Is there an area in your life, as I was identifying areas in my life, where you may feel controlled, mastered, enslaved, or dominated by? And maybe you have tried and tried to get free of this area, but then it keeps creeping, you know, creeping back in. You know, when you repent of something, that's great, and you turn away from it, but you turn toward God, for what he wants to replace it with. How, I mean, you all know a negative vow doesn't work. I'm not going to be like my mother. And the next thing you know, you start saying and doing things your mother did. 
Because when you focus on what you don't want to be, all you're doing is empowering that thing. You're keeping it in your field of vision. What you gaze upon, you're drawn toward. And so the just say no approach to life doesn't work. Can I, anybody ever tried it? You ever tried to use willpower to become who Jesus wanted you to be? Instead, you become a warped, frustrated person who sees all the problems in everybody else because they're just reflecting the problems you see in yourself. It's a miserable way to live. So you, the just say no approach doesn't work, but you've got to turn your heart. You don't make a negative, I don't want to be this like this. I want to be like you, Jesus, right? Pretty, pretty simple principle, pretty hard thing, in my opinion, to do. So my first question is, what does freedom... What does liberty in Christ actually mean? In our culture, most people think it means I get to do what I want. You're not the boss of me, right? That's freedom. I can just, I, all things are permissible. Great, I now can party any way that I want. But ask anybody who has had their life affected, broken by addiction, and they'll tell you true freedom is being able to choose to do what you don't want to do when nothing has control over you other than the Lord. Can I get an amen? And so I want to put a practical face on this. And by the way, I think most of us, when it comes to areas that we know are not beneficial in our life, there's a reason that we're going toward that. And one, say, one thing they say about addictions is you either go to your addiction to uh, get free from the pain, you know, you're running from pain, or you're running toward pleasure. Those are kind of the two driving forces. And so what do you run to when you're under stress, when you're under pressure, when you're frustrated, when you're... Uh, feeling out of control, when you're confused, do you run to, like some people, sex? Do you run to drugs, to alcohol? But guys, it gets more subtle than that. Some people run to food. Some people run to media. I can struggle with that. Some people run to control. I have a very dear friend. You don't have to raise your hand, sweetheart. Okay. <laughs> I have a very dear friend who's uh, amazing. I, I don't want to reveal who, but we were talking and praying for each other this week. And the Lord convicted him of his uh, running to, depending on, planning. He's an amazing, detailed planner, executor of things. He thinks everything through. He lays it out. He gets everybody well prepared. That's a gift, isn't it? To administrate something well. Intel you cross a line where you're actually planning because you don't want to fail, because you want to be able to depend on your plan. You don't want to do it in, with the Lord. You're now trying to exert control. My plan, we're going to honor this plan. We're going to do it exactly the way I laid it out. Now who are you trusting? God or your plan? And the Lord, even though it's an area his whole life, he thought, this is an area of strength. Oh, thank you, God. You've made me such a good planner. It's a gifting. And then the Lord's like, yeah, but you're using it with control. <laughs> How would you like that conviction? So these areas that we struggle with, these areas that may even be beneficial, they're never to be greater than our dependence and our submission on the Lord. Bill Johnson asks a, a great question. How much money is too much money for you to have? How much money can God bless you with and prosper you with? How much money is too much money? The amount that keeps you from trusting in God. If $50 is enough for you to feel like, Woo! I've got food for the foreseeable future. I don't need you, God. I'm going to go do my thing. And if $5 million makes you trust in the money and not in Him, then it has an influence. It has mastery. It has your heart in a way that it's not supposed to. Am I, am I connecting here? Apparently not. Okay, so other than, other than Lori, so I'll keep drilling. Yeah, that's right. So who or what do you go to for comfort or safety? Are you willing to let the Holy Spirit begin to show you areas like control or planning or media or food 
some area that you're going to go to. Uh, years ago, uh, Lori and I went through an extremely hard time. We were part of a community for 25 years, and because of the recession in 2008, we had to lay someone off. And, and long story short, when the decision was finally made, they really felt it was right to lay Lori and I off. So it was, for me, it was a, a time of liberty, like, woo, okay, God, what are you going to do now for Lori? She had to grieve the loss of so many relationships. Uh, but we both saw a counselor, which it was my first time, I think, intentionally of going after somebody with wisdom, and I'm looking for God to speak to me through this counselor, and his name was Jack Kennedy. And so we had this great talk, and I told him what I was all going through, and then I made this confession to him. I said, Jack, I have a struggle in my life that has been there my, off and on, but more on than off my whole life, and and the only way I can express this to you is I feel like I'm one of the most productive, lazy people you're ever going to meet. That there are some areas that I can procrastinate on in a self-destructive way. It's like I will avoid this task. And I'll do many, many other good tasks so I still look good, but I don't want to have to write this email. I don't want to have to confront this situation. Can I get an amen from anybody? Are there things that you know you avoid? And uh, by the way, the Lord even put a phrase on it later. You know what he told me? I'm just minding my own business, loving Jesus, praying, oh God, you know, break my heart and let me just be contrite and a broken and contrite heart you'll never reject or despise. And so I'm like loving God and he goes, you're addicted to avoidance. And I'm like, oh, thank you, Jesus. But he only says that kind of thing when he has something good for you in it. And so... I was talking about being addicted to avoidance, avoiding that task, and I'll never forget what Jack told me. It was the most incredible thing. He said, Charlie, have you ever considered that maybe you're not trying to avoid that task? And I went, no, it's the task I'm trying to avoid. And he goes, no, maybe it's what that task makes you feel. Maybe it's what that task is, you know, there are thoughts that you have around that that are hard for you. And I thought, that's crazy. So then he gave me an assignment. He said, Charlie, more than almost anyone else I know, you practice contemplative prayer. You practice waiting on the Lord and showing Him your heart and letting Him speak into your life. When you feel that, in my case, that jumpy, agitated, run for your life, you know, feeling, stop for a moment and turn and face that feeling that task, that jumpiness. Just enter into it. Don't be afraid of it. Be present with it. And then put it right here in your lap. And then turn your heart toward God and show it to Jesus. And I just thought, that's like the stupidest advice I've ever had in my life. This guy thinks he's a counselor. What is going on? But it stuck. And so that week, I started practicing that. And I want you to please enter into this message. What area in your life makes you jumpy? What area in your life do you try to avoid? What area in your life have you felt powerless against? And instead of going to the fridge, going to the TV, going to the pub, can we get to that place where we go to the Lord, put it on our lap, and say, Father, this has mastery over me. This is trying to dominate me. And I want to tell you, there was a season of grace, I think it lasted three months or so, where I had the, the grace, the empowerment, the discipline, to actually every time I was feeling that anxious, jumpy feeling, whoop, on my lap, show it to the Lord, and he would take it. Is that crazy? I mean, that is freedom. That is the kind of liberty he wants to bring into our lives. And so, one thing, I, I, I don't want to overemphasize, I don't want to underemphasize. Whatever that area is, any area in your life that begins to have more influence, more control over you than the Lord, the enemy only has one design, and that is for it to kill steal or destroy you 
And I don't know how many of you have walked down a progression where something started innocently enough and all of a sudden you realize, I really love parade animal cookies. And you don't buy a bag, you buy a case. And, and then you've got to have milk along with it. And oh, the frosting, the glazing, those little candy beads on the cookie. I mean, you begin to obsess. The enemy wants you to go so into that area of being mastered by cookies that it's going to affect your health and eventually destroy your life. And that may sound like a, a funny illustration, but I'm telling you, the people I have dealt with with addictions who feel powerless and hopeless against them, they need to learn that Jesus Christ is the answer. Turning to Him with that need can break the same kind of addict in, addiction and dependence that we have on other areas that may look good to others or not be. Um, I, don't, I didn't ask her if I could share this, so I'm going to. Do you know what Lori's was for a long time? You know, for, for off and on for me, it was TV for a season that I needed that mental massage, that mind numbing that comes from like... Staring at a tube. For Lori, it was reading. Oh, she's a reader. Oh, isn't that bright? Isn't that just... She's filling her mind with all this information. She was reading for distraction. She was reading to numb herself from areas of her life. I'm glad she's not in the room. But don't tell her what I said. So there are areas that we do that we may even get approval for, like my friend with his gift of planning, but in reality, it begins to control. And again, I, I don't want to overemphasize this, but I'll forget. Remember, for the rest of my life, I had a counseling session with somebody addicted to pornography. And uh, this guy, he was nearing the end of the road with the enemy's plan for him. And so he got so out of control, step by step, moment by moment, with pornography, that he had a job where he got paid once a month, and when he got his paycheck, he cashed his check and ran to the porn parlor and spent two or three days until all the money was gone. His rent, his food, gas, everything he had went to that addiction. And then he had to try to beg, borrow, or steal to live for another month to get his next check and repeat the cycle. Can you believe that? That's how bad it can get if we don't know how to break that cycle of shame, that cycle of decreasing our pain or increasing our pleasure. And I, I, I'm trying, if this isn't something you can relate to, you know the church is changing. I believe the post-COVID church is going to look different than the pre-COVID church. My friend Jeff has a great phrase that he ripped off from somebody else, that Jesus, if God isn't looking uh, for an, ar uh, an audience, He's looking for an army. He's looking to equip and empower all of us to bring freedom and liberty to other people. So right now, if you aren't hearing the Holy Spirit convict you of a personal area that has more control over your life than you would want, trust me, it can come. But at the very least, think about someone else you know who needs to know how to break that cycle and be there for someone else to bring freedom in an area that maybe they're not even aware of that has mastery over their life. So I know the enemy's plan is to kill, steal, and destroy, but God's plan is to what? Bring life and life abundantly. To bring you into that place of the power not to do whatever you want whenever you want, but the power to not do the thing that is going to be limiting to you or harmful to others. And that's what freedom is. Who? I love uh, John 6, 16, uh, I've been, I don't know why, uh, when the Holy Spirit says something to me, when he says something to you, his words are incredible. If you actually receive them, and they're really from him, uh, Ignatius said that when the Lord speaks a word, it's like a drop of water on a sponge. And your heart is that sponge. So when God says something to you and you are able to consent to it, to receive it, to go, okay, I think that's you, God, let me reflect on that, all of a sudden that word penetrates. And by the way, sometimes it penetrates when you don't even want it to or you're not even aware it is, but then all of a sudden it's on your mind that day, three, four times, that week, up 
again and again that word keeps coming because the Lord is watering it. His roots are getting established. It's going deep in your heart. And so in John 6.16, Jesus said, the words I speak are spirit and life. So everything the Lord speaks to you is intended to be a drop of water on your hungry, thirsty heart as a sponge to absorb and expand and increase and bring life and only life. It doesn't bring death. It doesn't bring enslavement. It doesn't bring anything negative. Isn't that? It's amazing to me that everything the Lord speaks brings that kind of life and that life abundantly. And so I, uh, I have two things I want to focus on as we're going. So how do you practically wrestle with those areas that either my neighbor or my family members enslaved in or areas that I've tried to repent of and I keep getting tripped up and it has more control over me than I want. And so I want to point you toward a principle in 2 Corinthians 5, 16 through 17. And uh, this is amazing to me. It says, from now on, starting today, starting with your walk with Jesus, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. So Paul is saying when he sees somebody else, he doesn't look at their weaknesses, he doesn't look at their failures, he doesn't look at their track record, he doesn't uh, use human judgment to consider who someone is and how to interact. Can you imagine being free of human understanding, human perspective, human judgment of other individuals. If somebody who hates you comes up and is belittling you, if you don't judge them according to the flesh, the flesh loves those who love them and hates those who hate them. Is that right? But the spirit, if someone is coming after you in a mean, vicious, ugly, deceptive way, if you judge them according to the spirit, it's like, God, what pain must they be in to be operating that way? I would so love to not judge no one according to the flesh. Can I get an amen? Any of you, would you like to be in that place where you can see people the, only the way God sees them? I want to challenge you. The message today is founded on a different conviction. Lord, I don't want to judge myself anymore according to the flesh. I have beat myself up long enough. I have tried to willpower my way through everything. I have tried to forget the things that I have disappointed me or frustrated me or that I feel powerless against. Lord, I don't want to judge myself according to the flesh. I want to judge myself according to the Spirit. Come on, right now. Lord, we just received that. We know that's your heart toward us. We know that you died to bring us into freedom. We've been set free indeed. We know you're taking us into this expanding land of opportunity and of liberty and freedom to be who we're created to be. And so we just receive that as our inheritance in you to no longer judge ourselves according to our own understanding and flesh, but Jesus, take us to that higher perspective of being seated in those heavenly places with you, and the freedom that that brings to be mastered by nothing, dominated by nothing, controlled by nothing else in our world. You're our Lord, and nothing else is. In Jesus' name, amen. Can I get an amen? Ho! Oh, that has got to be so deeply, deeply rooted in our hearts. What his intention, his desire is, for every broken area in our life, he only wants freedom. And he doesn't do it with condemnation. He doesn't shame us into being better people. So Cheryl, this is your moment. Come on up. I, I want you to share that testimony that has affected so many other people. It cracks me up, but I believe it really reflects the heart of God toward you and us. <laughs> um, so I was sitting at a red light. I'm kind of beating myself up thinking what a failure I was and not Everything. you, Cheryl. You're so sweet. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Okay. Anyway, and um, so I did one of those prayers you do when you're just in the moment. I said, Jesus, is there any way I could possibly be saved and watch as much Netflix as I do? And um, I, right away I heard the Lord say, evidently. Forget everything I've said. Just remember that. When you bring your shame to Jesus, 
He doesn't give you shame in return. He gives you his perspective. Well, you're saved, so evidently. <laughs> yeah, Gloria. Wait, well, then you got to come on up because it won't be on the tape and it won't be no good. I have an amazing testimony that the Lord just recently set me free. Um, there you go. I've, uh, uh, I've always struggled with um, me, not liking me. Um, kind of always mad at God for making me me, designing me. And uh, so uh, there's three parts to this, but I'm just, I'm just going to finish the very end part. Um, I was praying, and one of the things the Lord showed me was that I was holding on to shame for years and years. The shame just kept me, and then I had this self-hatred, really ran deep, and when he showed it, I, I have, like, when he shows me stuff sometimes, I've tried to change me myself, and it never works, and uh, so I finally said, okay, I give this to you. I don't know what to do with it. I can't, I can't fix me. And um, so when they, just a few days ago, I, I, I wrote out for years all this pain in my childhood and growing up that has hurt me so deeply and, and I've never been able to be healed from it. And, I, and I've gone through other healing ministries. ministries. So I wrote out all these different times from as as young as I can remember to whatever, uh, of all the times I've experienced rejection as a little girl to even to now. Or even sometimes I feel like God was rejecting me, honestly. And um, or putting me on, uh, like, back this way. So I wrote all this stuff out. Uh, and the next morning, sometimes the Lord speaks to me when I'm waking up. And as I'm waking up, it's like I saw this segment of my life and all this rejection. I saw it and the, the pain. And then he said, that was the enemy that was setting all those things up, all that rejection. That wasn't me. That was the enemy. And he said, and, and the verse, I've stood on it before, that he said that um, he knew me, he chose me, he chose us, even before he laid the foundation of the universe. And he said, you have always been accepted. Hmm. I mean, I don't know. When I saw that it was, that was, that wasn't me, that was a setup by the enemy, and he had always accepted me. I don't know how to explain it to you, but it's like I saw. And I saw that I really was a new creation created in Christ Jesus. I've never been able to see it before. I've, I've read it. I prayed it. I knew it up here. People say, you need to know your identity in Christ. I could not believe it. I couldn't mm. grasp it. But I am a new creation. Come on. I am chosen by God, and he deeply loves me. And, I, and it's like... It's like, like what I believe he's saying to me now. I want you to learn to live out of your spirit, not out of that flesh, not out of what you felt and experienced all those years. Come on. So I'm just saying it, that's where I'm at now. Wow. Come on, Gloria. Jeez. I just sort of tee it up, and then everyone else is whoosh. I love that. How? So the verse that we were talking about, 2 Corinthians 5.16 from now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Verse 17, Gloria. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. If you are in Christ. If you're not, get it squared away. Just Humble your heart. Just invite Him in. Just have somebody pray. I, I, it doesn't have to be the four spiritual laws. It 
It doesn't have to even be a sinner's prayer. It's a heart attitude. God, I'm sick of the sickness that I've carried, of the sin that has burdened and weighed me down, of my own failure. God, I just, I've got to surrender it. I've got to give it up to you, Jesus. Only you can forgive sin, and only you can make me a new creature, a new creation. But then, by his power, he wants us to live out of that place. And so I'll get a little personal. Um, I'm trying to keep it age appropriate. But one of the more profound experiences I've had of this exact truth that Gloria was talking about, Cheryl was talking about, Robert was talking about, uh, of not judging myself according to the flesh. And some of you have heard this story. It was several years ago. I was in the lobby of Fred Meyer. And I'm just living my life and minding my own business. And all of a sudden, an attractive lady goes walking by. And I heard this voice inside me just rise up and go, you know, I would sleep with her if I could. And the shame, the guilt, what kind of, am I even a Christian? What kind of man am I? Lord, how can I even have these desires, have that impulse? You know, I I love my wife. I love, God, what's wrong with me? And I just started beating myself up. And it hit me in that moment. And that's what we need. Not a theory, not during a sermon, not during class, but in the battle. When that comes and tries to bring condemnation and shame back into your life, Lord, how could I think a thought like that? And then I went, wait! That wasn't even me. That was my flesh. That's not who I am in the Spirit. I would never want to defy my community and you, Lord, and disgrace myself and my family. God, I would never want to to violate who I am in such an awful way. Thank you for making me a new person that lives out of that place. Do you understand? We have to break that power where we think we are sin instead of freed from sin and we are saints. And so... That's what the heart of this message is. I was going to read some journaling thing. I'll share it with Lori. It's, it's, in some ways, it's kind of personal. I don't mind sharing personal things, obviously. But I think it's a distraction. So, for me, at the end of me talking to the Lord this morning about an area of personal struggle, uh, I, I just heard the Lord say, this is a call to the secret place. So when I shared the story about putting the fear, putting the agitation, putting the anxiety on my lap and then showing it to God. Showing it to God is that secret place in your walk with Him where you trust your pain to Jesus and you let Him take it and free you from it. I want to add one last thing. So for me, that's still the heartbeat. If you don't have that walk with Him, you're not really that new creation, then you are going to be tormented. Uh, Francis Schaeffer, a tremendous theologian from kind of the previous generation, he said when people come and they're under the burden and the weight of their sin and they feel like life is meaningless, life is hopeless, there's no point. If we die and we all go into the dirt, then what does it matter? In many ways, they've drawn the right conclusion. To try to talk them out of feeling bad, of living in the flesh, is ridiculous because they've drawn the right conclusion. But the reality is, That isn't where God left us. He wants us to be able to live in the Spirit and get free from all of that and bring freedom into other people's lives from all of that through that simple entrusting our hearts to Him and showing Him that pain and letting Him take it. And it's weird that after 40 years, I still have areas that I'm learning how to give it to Him in this way. I will say that we have one other tool that's incredibly powerful. If you feel there's an area that has more influence, more control over your life than it's supposed to, an area you feel powerless against and you really have doubted over the years that even Jesus can change the control, the effect this area has over your life, as not an act of willpower, but as a step of faith, God, I want you, you can choose to take a break from licorice, from TV, from whatever area, you can say, Lord, I'm taking a fast. I'm giving you this area for now. I'm making a choice in my will, not out of my willpower, but out of my desire to have you to see from your perspective what this area is about. I'm stepping away from it and taking a break 
And by the way, sometimes that's the only way you know if it really does have control over you. Sometimes you think you're doing okay, but the minute you try to stop, you realize you're not. And that's where you come back again to giving it to him and entrusting it to his care. So if you're not sure if there's an area that has undue influence in your life, um, I don't mind sharing this. Lori and I years ago discovered we have the freedom to have a glass of wine, to have a glass of beer with a friend or cider, whatever. But uh, we decided, you know, we're not sure how much control this has. We're not sure how beneficial it's been, how much time has been wasted, how much has dissipated, you know, our time together. And so let's take a fast. So we're six weeks or so into about a three month fast from drinking just to go, okay, Lord, purify that area. If there's any control, if it's affecting our marriage, if it's affecting any area of our life, the only way I know how to break the power of anything over my life is to take a break from it. Is that, it's not confusing. It's not complicated. But again, I want to challenge you, don't do it as a religious act. Do it as a relational act. I want you in every area and not anything that's going to have mastery, domination, or enslavement over my life. Ho! Oh, that's a good word right there. I, I hope it's a hopeful word. Maybe a good place to end it, it's not even in my notes, is just the simplicity of uh, Romans chapter 8. For we know for those who are in Christ, there is no condemnation. He broke the power of sin, broke the power of shame, broke the power of your flesh, broke the false identity that's still been trying to hold us down from being who Christ died. All of that is not from Him. Get rid of it. Don't spend one more minute in condemnation. It's not going to bear any good fruit. Embrace the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And that means seeing it from his perspective and the empowerment he's already given you to walk in freedom. That's a promise. That is a great hope. So I want to challenge you, if this message has tugged on your heart, if you feel an area that you feel like you either personally do respond for or if you're too embarrassed to come forward and acknowledge that there's some area that has control over you that you don't want, then I'm going to also invite you, if you know somebody struggling with addiction, struggling with any area that has mastered their life, has been a negative influence, anger, control, any area, then you can stand in proxy for that person and ask for God to reveal his perspective to that person and set them free from that area of addiction or control. So is that clear? If you have an area you want to respond to, or if there's someone in your life you want to respond to, just stand up with me. I'm standing up on my own behalf, and we're going to respond now. Because sometimes we preach the Word of God, we'll share the Gospel, and then we don't even give people a chance to respond and to receive what God has revealed to us. So, wow. Whew. Ho! Hmm. So, Father, we thank you so much for sending your Son to break the power of condemnation and shame throughout the entire world for all time. What an incredible, generous, generous plan you had toward us individually and toward mankind. We, it boggles our mind to be forgiven of something we don't deserve. And yet, that's the only way we can walk in the freedom as sons and daughters that you died for us to have. And for those in our lives, God, we desire that for them as well. So today, as a prophetic act, we are all standing together and we declare the truth that although everything may be permissible or lawful for me, not everything's going to be beneficial. And even though everything's lawful for me, <clears throat> we're not to be mastered by anything. And so I just pray for the person who's standing in faith, breaking the power of control in a specific area of their life. Jesus, come now as they show you the pain, as they show you the fear as they show you, the anxiety. Ho! Oh, Holy Spirit, come and just lift that off of their heart. Take that burden. Let them leave it right there at the very foot of your cross that you died for them to be set free in this area. And Lord, for those who are interceding for friends, loved ones, neighbors, God, I ask for that same uh, identificational repentance, that same act as they're standing before you. They're crying out to break the power of condemnation that's been a snare holding back people in addiction. And Lord, we ask you to just break and cut off that snare and release not judgment of the flesh, but judgment of your spirit, that they can see things from your perspective and that you have something so much greater for them that they will joyfully lay down anything and let you be the Lord of that area of their life and not 
some area of distraction or avoidance or of addiction. So I just thank you for each person here and the faith that brought them this morning, the faith that had them stand, and the faith, Lord, that's going to heal their hearts and my heart to walk in the freedom that you died for us all to have. We thank you for this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen, amen, amen. amen. Uh, we had a talk with some friends last night. And by the way, ho, uh, we won't be able to do this for people who are virtual, but I want to start having more of a time of ministry uh, during services and get kind of a ministry team together that can pray for salvation, for deliverance, for healing, for restoration. And so just if you are interested in that, uh, it, it's time for us to begin to uh, allow that ministry, that empowered ministry and prayer again as a community. And, and can I get an amen on that one? Do some people agree that, yeah, well, Jeff, just because we talked about it, you know, you were the one I was with, so I knew I'd get an amen from somebody. So anyway, God bless you all. What a wonderful day. Enjoy your weekend. By the way, Lori and I are out of town on our final vacation for the year, and so if you have any problems and you need somebody to complain to, call Miko. So God bless you all.